we set out, we were like, we want to fund one well a year. Like that's, that was our goal. So this thing literally exploded pretty quick. Cause on my first trip, I came across a little boy who was dying from water related disease. And we were going to film the drilling of our first well. So we accidentally filmed this experience of meeting this little boy. So all of a sudden the statistics became a person. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whenever you may be listening, and welcome to Latitude, the 43 North podcast. I'm your host, Nate Benson, director of content here at 43 North, and we've got a fantastic show for you this week. How do you do some good? There are many ways, and good comes in all shapes and sizes. For Kate and Joe Vacanti, their calling was to help people access water. One in seven people in the world lack access to clean water, and 3.5 million people die each year from waterborne illnesses. On the continent of Africa, 40 billion hours are spent each year walking to access clean sources of water. This week on the podcast, my co-host Darren Treadway and I talk with Kate and Joe about Let Them LOL, their nonprofit initiative that is building water wells in Sierra Leone. To date, Let Them LOL has built 105 wells, bringing clean water to more than 42,000 people. Why did they choose Sierra Leone? How difficult was digging that first well? And was entrepreneurship always the plan? This episode of Latitude is presented by the University at Buffalo School of Management Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. So let's get right into this week's episode with myself and Darren Treadway with Let Them LOL. Darren, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? Uh, not bad for a rainy Friday. This is when we're recording. It's a rainy Friday, but uh, not too bad. How's the semester going there for us? Going great. Just getting ready for uh, our conference in uh, early May and uh, winding down the semester. All the good things that um, make for theoretically summer in Buffalo. Any uh, any stand-up students you want to plug here on the, on, the, on the podcast? Who's really just excelling? Or who's all of my students are exceptional, and I hope they'll remember that when they do their ratings. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> very nice. Um, so we have some fantastic guests today, but uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, let them LOL. Laugh out loud. Hi guys, how are you? We're great. Thanks for having us. Give us the quick pitch of who you are and what you do. So we're a 501c3 charity. We started about 10 years ago, celebrating our 10th anniversary, and very grassroots uh, from Buffalo, based out of Buffalo. And we started off drilling water wells in Sierra Leone, and we now have a school, hospital, basically all kinds of holistic development going on over there. But even further back, who are you? Well, that is a question. <laughs> I'm Kate Vicanti, and... Uh, you can introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, I'm Joe Vicani. <laughs> you uh, know who you are. <laughs> we are actually UB grads. So we're a big fan of the UB and uh, university alumni. Uh, we graduated in pharmacy school in 2000. My wife was a nursing student. She graduated in 2002. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so how did all this, so how did, you know, drilling wells in Sierra Leone, of all places, how did this come about? You mean I don't look like a well driller to you? I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> it's okay. Of the Definitely not. Table, I think I look like the most. You're wearing a, you're wearing a vest. A vest, plaid, plaid. I've got boots on. I right. would be the, the digger here. But uh, so how did all this come about? Yeah. So Joe used to be a pharmacist. I used to be a nurse. And actually, when we met, uh, we joke because some people are like, "That sounds like a bait and switch." But when we met, he actually said he wanted to work with youth. So we kind of knew pharmacy was going to be. A starting point and then later he was gonna go and work with you so a little bit of a pay difference there so I knew that going into it was excited about it because for me growing up some youth workers in my life were a really big impact so anyways as part of that being a, a youth worker we went to a conference and at the conference they had different breakouts and one of the breakouts was uh, called cultured and we were like well, we think we're pretty up on what's happening in the world. That's interesting. Let's see what they have to say. And at that, they kind of mentioned as a side note, they were talking about lots of things, and they said, do you guys know at the time that there are a billion people without clean water, and every day 4,000 children are dying from water-related disease? And it was that number, that it was like one every 20 seconds, that number of kids dying that we were like, what? I mean, from medical backgrounds, we're like, clean water is such a necessity for life and we know that there's things like cancer and, and challenging diseases that we need to research to find a solution but people not having clean water and dying from that just get them clean water right. and so that was the start of us hearing about this issue and we're like what can we do to help change it and what was it about Sierra Leone you know that, you know because obviously you know billion people without you know access to clean water so a lot of probably places you could have picked from why Sierra Leone yeah 
We uh, so the organization that we partnered with for this first uh, well that we drilled was in um, Uganda. Uh, it was when sorry, it's in Rwanda, mm-hmm. and the organization was based out of uh, Atlanta. So we had, after we raised funds, delivered this check to help uh, raise uh, the well for the people in uh, Rwanda, and we kind of felt that's great, but. How do we get to Atlanta every year? And we knew that, you know, Buffalo is one of those cities that we're the city of good neighbors. There are so many people from this community that love to come together. Uh, you see that all, all the time, and that's what we love. And we knew that we had a lot of friends in Buffalo who would love to get involved. So we figured at some point we should do something local. And an opportunity came up through some relationships that we had here that there was an organization already working uh, in Sierra Leone thought that was a great way to partner so we started partnering with them and then through partnering with them we would take trips and uh, my wife eventually ran into on, on these trips we would go and meet different chiefs so before you go into a place you uh, obviously you pay your respects and you learn about what their, their customs and their cultures and so whenever we went in to do an, uh, an assessment in a village we would meet the chief first and my wife met one of the female chiefs one time and uh, the lady had said, you know, I'm, I'm a female leader, you're a female leader, and there's no NGOs in my region. And so the chief basically offered us an opportunity to work in her region and offered us some land. And uh, we've been, my wife's been working with her, and it's been pretty incredible, all the development that's been happening. So we just wanted to help, and uh, we feel like Sierra Leone came to us. So we didn't necessarily target it. It's just through relationships and opportunities, and, you know, we feel like God just put it in our path, and we said, well, let's do it. Well, certainly a country needed, you know, one of the highest under five mortality rates in the world. Life expectancy is only 45. Uh, one in 50 women die of childbirth. This is all into our culture and website. And then if that's not bad enough, you know, 2014, they had an Ebola outbreak. So it's like it doesn't seem like it's like one thing after another, mm-hmm. right? It seemed to not be able to get ahead. Yeah, definitely. And they had an 11-year civil war. So it's, you know, one of those things. They're, they're rich in a lot of natural resources, but they've never been able to harness them for themselves. They've been, you know, pretty taken advantage of. So my one friend said early on on a trip, it's like they're behind before they even get started. And our goal, our mission statement is that we empower those experiencing unjust suffering. Our goal is to help them get to the starting line because we believe that they have everything in them to raise themselves up out of poverty but if you're dying from water-related disease or things like Ebola or you can only eat once a day, you don't have the energy to get yourself going. And we've seen it over and over again. You know, In theory, that all sounds great. And then it's like, is it actually going to happen? And we've seen where we come into a village, we're ready to put a well in, and we say, well, guys, we can't get our drilling truck here. And we leave and come back the next day, and they've taken machetes and made themselves a road, like staying up all night, the youth and, and everybody coming together. And now... Not only does that help get the drilling rig in, but now they have access into their village to maybe get in and out, to get wood out and other things that they're growing that they could actually sell. Yeah. I mean, one of our values is we're a community here with a community there. And there's a humility that you have to recognize that you you don't walk in and you're not um, the savior for different people. Um, They are an incredible people, and we've gotten to know them. They are our friends, and, you know, we just really believe that there are a lot of people that have so much potential. They just don't have sometimes that first opportunity. So we have a humility, and the people that are involved with us know. Um, once you get to know people, they're, they're incredibly smart. They are hardworking. You know, they want better lives for themselves. So uh, it's important to have a, a humility about that and recognize that you know, it's a, a greater community, not just in your region, but across the world. We're very connected because of the Internet. So we kind of like there's a, there's a global community and responsibility to help our fellow people, whether they're here, but also overseas. So we're just thankful for the opportunity we've been given to serve. And the thing is, as we have served and worked with them, they've actually taught us so much more about life and what it means. And my wife has this statement she came up with a couple of years ago, and it was... uh, Yeah, I say that while um, they live in physical poverty, they have an abundance of community and contentment, where we'll walk into villages... And we don't make any promises, even if the drill rig is right outside the village, because what can go wrong will go wrong, and you don't want to give somebody, get somebody's hopes up that's already in a tough spot. But we'll walk into villages, not make any promises, and we'll walk out with our arms full of chickens and and produce and all kinds of stuff. And you know that for them, that's like a once or twice a year meal that they'll have a chicken, right? And you can't, it's very tough, but you can't not accept that, not give them that opportunity. 
And so I say that while they have uh, physical poverty, they have an abundance of community and contentment, and a lot of people um, in communities where we live have a material abundance but can have a poverty of community and contentment. And so we feel like what we have to learn from them in some ways is greater than what we're bringing to them. Yeah. I think it's, um, your story is, is amazing. Um, and I think you, you, you raise a lot of different topics and ideas. And I, I think perhaps who you are as people, what drives you value-wise is, is probably if I ask you how you get here, you'd say, well, it's just my values, it's what God called me to do, right? Let me ask you to reflect just a little bit. Mm -hmm. When we talk about this, Ray, you, t you talked about the social networks and the social capital Can you talk a little bit to um, the budding entrepreneur or the, the budding social activist about any kind of insights you have for how to either build or leverage social capital to, to create these kind of change makers? Yeah, I think the starting point for anyone who's interested in doing something is you have to be passionate about it, regardless as if, as if anyone's coming with you. Uh, if you have to go alone, you go in alone. Because if you're going to really change and impact culture and people, uh, it's going to be a lot of long hours, a lot of hard work, and you're going to be up late and you're going to get up early. But if your why for doing it and your reason for doing it, that's that's what's going to motivate you. So honestly, I think the starting point is actually not even looking at relationships that you have, but it's looking at who are you as a person. And for us, at the time where we launched this, um, you know, we had a lot of time with people, and so people knew who we were. So I guess. I would encourage the entrepreneur to say, who are you as a person? How do you treat people, and how have you treated people? Do you just have relationships with people from what you can get from them? Or are you a person who invests in people, cares about people? Because for us, when we first launched the organization, there are people who jumped on board, didn't even know what we were doing because they knew who we were and the kind of people we were. So I guess first look at yourself and say, what kind of person are you? Uh, also, what's your motivation cause, and what's your why for doing it? So for us, you know, what was compelling us was, you know, we believe Jesus when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And so you have to ask, well, who's my neighbor? And so if I have a friend, if you guys, I just met you guys, but Darren, if you were, you were thirsty, you know, I wouldn't just walk up to you and say, well, hey, buddy, you know, let me pray for you. Like, I'd probably give you something to drink. That's going to actually help you. And so our motivation is really flows out of his command. We believe him that, uh, we should love our neighbors. So as far as the networks, what's cool is when you lead out, people will come to you. And I would say people come to us with gifts all the time. I remember when we first started our organization, uh, I was doing all the accounting. So I am a type A. I am a very organized person. So so I was the – well, I was a pharmacist student. So, so, But I always put off goofy because that's actually fun, you know. But – Believe it or not, i a uh, very organized person. So I was doing all the accounting, but we knew this could be long term. So there was a young lady who came to us and said, uh, hey, I'd like to get involved with the organization, but uh, you know, I don't know what I can do. And we said, well, what are you passionate about? What do you like doing? She says, well, I'm an accountant. And we were just like, well, good. We need one of those. And another friend of ours uh, who don't live here now, but um, came on a trip, and uh, he's like, hey, what can I do? What do you like doing? Well, he had m served in the military, and he knew how to actually do um, the GPS mapping. So we said, hey, you can help GPS map all our wells in Africa. And so with his partnership, we were able to go over there and GPS locate. So if you go on our website, you can actually click on and see where all our wells are. So as our organization has grown, it has been the strength of the people who have gotten involved. And we just found out what are your gifts. It hasn't been us forcing relationships or forcing. So I would say that an entrepreneur – People see through, you know, if you're inauthentic and you're just using someone for their gifts, people see through that. People don't want to be a part of that. So I would say look at your friends. Look who's coming around you. Ask them what they're passionate about. Ask them what they're gifted in, and then release them into those gifts. That's awesome. People do not live through your hard work. And so you took those necessarily, and then you, you built there by the same strategy, right? Like coming in saying, I want to help, and then giving back through that kind of reciprocity that you see in relationships. Through that, you met Kate, and you probably want to talk about it because it's meant something. But, um, you met a female chief. Uh, we're coming up on a conference on inclusion here in Maryland, and we have Barb Stegman, who's also a social entrepreneur, uh, speaking. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about female leadership challenges, 
And then I know you're gonna say R1, you go back to the interactive uh, female chief there. Do you see similarities in the challenges or, or is it more difficult there or, or more difficult here kind of? Yeah, I would say I actually think it's it's a lot of the same. Um, I think a lot of it depends on you as a female leader being able to kind of rise above that. Um, we happened upon her by accident. Um, in, a, in a country of Sierra Leone, they have these paramount chiefs. So they have a democracy, but also still the old chiefdom system. And the chiefs speak into uh, the politics and, uh, and are really involved. And so out of about 20 paramount chiefs, there probably is a little bit more. So they're kind of like governors of a region. I think at the time, there were only two who are women. So we just happen, you know, by luck or whatever you want to say that it is, um, something bigger than that to end up with one of these chiefs who approached us and saw what we were trying to do and, and gave us this land. And, you know, it was just kind of one of those, like, you know, head nod, kind of like wink things, like, like he said, you know, you're a female leader, I am, you know, we kind of get each other, so let's, you know, let's do something here together. And so, you know, I would just say that some of it is, you know, pers breaking down people's um, perceptions. What I've learned is you just have to, you, you can't do things based on your background or if you're male or female or where you come from. You just have to say, okay, I have these opportunities in front of me. I know how I'm wired. I know how to bring people together. I'm just going to do it. And you really have to learn, not in a disrespectful way, but if, if somebody, male or female, because a lot of times other women have a problem with women leaders just as much as sometimes men might have a problem with women leaders. And so what's been very helpful is there's every day thousands of kids dying from not having clean water. And so you just focus on that and you're like, if anybody's got, like, we're going after this. You want to judge if I should be doing it or not doing it. You know, we're going to do it. You want to join us? Join us. So that has really helped. I, I don't know. I'd like to think if I was in some kind of other industry and had leadership desires and qualities that I could have risen up, but I'm not sure. I think because of it being within this, because I didn't step into this saying I need to lead something. It was kind of, you know, kicking and screaming a little bit, but... <laughs> Um, I think because of the issue that we're doing, that just helps to, to create such a focus. And you just say, well, I'm going to have to get over it, and everybody else is going to have to get over it because we're going to go after this because there's kids dying, and it's not okay. You know, startups experience difficulties um, you know, across the board when they're at the ground. You know, and even established companies, you know, when they're trying to do business in countries that maybe aren't as established as doing business here in the New York State, um, there's logistic nightmares. How, as a startup organization, have you been able to overcome some of the challenges logistically? What are those problems logistically in terms of the business side of things or just trying to you know, get boots or trucks on the ground? Yeah. How many hours do we have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah. Again, like we set out, we were like, we want to fund one well a year. Like that's that was our goal. So this thing literally exploded pretty quick because on my first trip, I came across a little boy who was dying from water related disease. And we were going to film the drilling of our first well. So we accidentally filmed this experience of meeting this little boy. So all of a sudden, the statistics became a person. And we brought that back in the next year. 15 wells were funded and then all of a sudden we're going back and seeing the wells and finding kids who are street kids and now we need to do a children's home now we need to educate these kids now this chief is giving us 30 acres of land and it just was like this like onion and 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 so many layers and in each one of those steps we we faced like nightmares that made us want to want to say you know we we need to stop but again, you know, like I said before, I think that just focusing on it doesn't matter if it's, you know, not for profit work, as long as like Joe said earlier, it's something that you're passionate about. If you keep that as your center and your anchor, you're going to face each problem as it comes. And we don't know everything. So we search for people that who's doing it something, who's doing it better, who's already gone before us in this and share the problem that we're having. Look for advice. Be humble to say. Don't be afraid of making a mistake because we've faced a lot of that too where, you know, best intentions. And if you can admit, you know, okay, that was really dumb. Okay, let's laugh about it <laughs> and, and let's figure out how to not do that again and let's apologize where we need to apologize and, and move forward. So I would say, I would say um, we've just 
face the problems as we've come. I, I mean, I could detail them out to the, the most dramatic, I would say, is we were facing some challenges with the quality of our wells being drilled. And some of that was in the equipment of the company that we were hiring to drill it. It had limited capacity because Sierra Leone has a dry season. So you can drill to a certain depth um, three quarters of the year. But if you don't drill in the dry season or drill deep enough, then the wells will go dry for a couple of months. That's really terrible because now people have been used to drinking clean water and they're going back to the stream, which is even worse than just drinking from the stream all the time. So through convoluted things that don't make sense, um, we end up getting a million dollar drill rig donated to us that can reach further depths so that we can hit two aquifers, they're called, so that the wells will never go dry. Sounds wonderful. So we, we get it shipped over there. It's en, en route, and next thing we know, Ebola hits Sierra Leone. Now the CDC, everybody's shutting it down. You can't go in. Well, we didn't have any well drillers of our own. We had identified somebody, but we needed to bring a drilling consultant in to help train the guys on this particular million-dollar rig that we didn't want to break. Well, so now he can't go in because of Ebola. So now this drill rig is sitting on our campus. So finally, towards the end of Ebola, I say to our board and to some people, I say, look, you know, there's more people dying from not having clean water than are dying from Ebola. So we have to go. Like, we have to get this going. And the CDC had gotten a little bit more flexible about letting people in. So I knew if I said I would go, the drilling consultant would come with us. So we decided to do that. So we're excited. We're finally, after all these years of challenges of wells not being the quality we want them to be despite best efforts we're going to do it turn the machine on day one it starts on fire because what happened rats got inside of it while it was sitting right why wouldn't they and they built a nest so next thing we know i look over and one of our mechanics is dumping water on the machine and i'm like i'm not mechanically inclined but i don't think you want to be putting water on an engine and it was just literally thing after thing after thing and we were there for almost two weeks and I wish it was like a happy story to say that we drilled that well, but it, it didn't happen. They finally drilled, you know, it was crooked, couldn't get the pipes down. Then, you know, they disconnected the drill bit the wrong way. Next thing you know, the drill bit falls down into a, a hundred foot hole that's only eight inches wide. So there's no way you're getting that out. And I mean, it was nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. And I have to come home and tell this donor who gave us this million dollar <laughs> drill rig, um, cause we, I felt like we owed it to him. Just a reminder, we told you we weren't well drillers. That's why we brought this consultant in and, uh, we made a mess of things and, but he, he literally laughed at us and I said, thank you very much. And it's like, cause he had done a startup business himself. He's like, well, that was a good lesson and we're just going to keep going and, and try again. So that's kind of a story that explains how we've kind of persevered through each and every one of the many of those challenges. You know, on a practical level for people listening, um, there are two, I think, decisions you have to make. And it starts with making up your mind. You got to make up your mind. You got to say, why am I doing this? And for us, the compelling why has been uh, there are many people in the world today that are experiencing unjust suffering. And all you got to do is personalize it. And you imagine that that's your friend, that's someone you, a uh, parent, someone you know. And you think if that was them and they were over there, I, no matter how difficult it is, I'm getting up and I'm doing this. So the first thing is you have to have a compelling why. Otherwise, it's going to be tough. You will always have problems and then critics. And so what you do have to do is make up your mind about how am I going to deal with critics because they're going to come. So in advance, you have to recognize you can't control what other people think and you can't waste emotional energy trying to answer all your critics. And a quote that my wife and I, we have hanging in our office at home, it's uh, by uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And I'm sure you've heard it before, but uh, he says, it's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails by daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with the cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. Words and things you've used to describe uh, your 
So I'm going to ask you a, a question. All those are kind of based on the idea of some sort of spiritual undertaking. Um, to what degree or in what way does your faith, and I know you're doing another job, but <laughs> to what degree does your, your faith inform you and the way you live? Yeah, th- I think everything about what we do stems directly from our faith. And so... Uh, my wife and I, I'm a pastor, and so, and we don't hide that from people. People know that about me. Um, all I gotta do is look at my social media and my stuff, and you, you know, right away. Um, it actually is the genesis of who we are. Like I said, it, it, you know, who you believe in or who you, everyone has a, a source they pull back to and they look at. So, whatever that role model is, for us, you know, it's Jesus. So we look at his model and we literally try to follow his ways. So, that really for us is the inspiration. So, when you think about the words you said, service, humility, love, giving. I mean, those are all things that, and, and even if you don't even are a religious person, but you know of what Jesus did, you would you would label those things of him as a person. Um, and so honestly, our faith and, and our faith in him is the genesis for who we are uh, and why we do what we do. You know, scaling something like this, you know, all businesses have to scale. So how, what's the methodology in which you guys want to scale this? So if you want to start with this business, one relatively new, you've built 15. So obviously, you know, scale is inherent in what you're trying to do. So how do you, how do you manage that, especially, like I said earlier, in a country that, you know, uh, is struggling with development? You know, if they don't have a road to get to the village, you're not going to be able to get across it. So what have some of the challenges been from a scaling standpoint? Um, and what have you learned that maybe other startups and entrepreneurs would learn from? Yeah, I think that the biggest challenge in scaling is finding the right people because we want to find the right people, find people that are better that, than us at a certain task. I mean, you start off, you're doing everything, right? <laughs> you're the accountant, which he's really good at, but you know, you're, do, you're doing everything, and then you know, you, that's not sustainable long haul as it grows. So on, on this side of the ocean, you know, it's been a little bit easier to find people that come in and, and we can fit them with what their talents are. Over there, the challenge has been, first of all, we're about five hours from the capital, so there's only two major cities there, and then the, there's smaller ones after that. So we're in an incredibly remote area. So in a country where only about 1% of the population has the opportunity for higher education to find highly, highly qualified people um, is a challenge than to find people that are willing to come down that maybe have gotten out of the uh, nitty gritty, difficult village life. Now you're educated, and you don't want to go back and and live there. That's been a challenge too. So we've had to do things like um, staff housing, and educating their children for free, and some different programs like that to um, make it appealing, and not even appealing in a, a way like they're like holding out on wanting to help their people, but just provide them the basic, most basic facilities so that they can be comfortable to come and serve their own people. But I will say. Um, A couple of years ago, something shifted, and we started getting tons of applicants and people that wanted to come and leave City Life down, um, not only for this steady job, which we're able to provide, but because they're passionate about their own people. Like, you could feel frustrated at first, like, where are the people that are passionate for their own people? They're there. You just have to have to find them and provide them the basic facilities. And then you see them take it off from there. And we find out by accident that... um, some of our teachers, because we have homes for kids that are orphans, and then we find out that some of our teachers have noticed that the kids in their classroom don't have parents, and so next thing they're taking them in and using 100% of their salary to take care of these kids on top of being teachers at our school and educating. Or we'll be there on a weekend and be like, what's all that noise at the school? School's not going on right now. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know, but... Some of these kids are so behind. They've been out of school for years. The teachers are volunteering on the weekends to be there all day. So I think the biggest challenge in, in scaling is is the right people. And uh, over, if you're patient enough, if you 
don't get knocked down by the bad people that you find on both sides because people will come around that have bad motives regardless of what country or where you're operating. But if you can persevere through that, you know, the whole thing, the cream does rise to the top and you find those people and you unleash them into what their passion is, then they will attract more people like them. You know, as we wrap up, you know, the one question I haven't asked yet that I'm always fascinated by these answers, how did you come up with these? You want to share that one? Since you're the yeah. voice of it. I'll have to uh, just bring it up. You can edit this later, right? Okay, sure. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, we, we all. <laughs> well, I, I got I to get something ready because my phone's off. Okay. Are you going to warn them? No. Yeah, so how we came up with the name was what well, was one we recognized you don't you don't give people dignity, you just affirm it. And we learned that from somewhere, someone, so I don't take credit for that. I don't remember who said it though. Um but that's true. Like these are real people, they're smart people, and so that's why the word let them was important because it was they can pull themselves out if they have the opportunity. You know, if you if you're in if you're in a a, a, a prison cell and you got chains on your legs, chains on your arms, someone's holding you back, they can't do much, but maybe it's just you have a key in your hand that someone's given to you to say, hey, you're a fellow man, I'm going to unlock one of your chains, and they actually can get themselves out. So the idea of let them was these are great people. They just need this first opportunity. And for us, it was clean water. So th they can't even live and survive and even get out of whatever they're trying to get out of unless they have the basic need. So that was the let them. And then the laugh out loud basically came from, once again, finding people's gifts. So I was actually born with a really weird laugh. And my laugh uh, made friends and it made enemies. You either liked my laugh in high school or you hated it. And so working with youth, one of the kids one day said, oh, man, if I can get your laugh on a ringtone, I would, I would get it. And it just, I was like, really? And so we talked about it and we thought, you know, we work with youth. And they actually do want to help and be a part of solving the world's problems, but they don't have money. Uh, but they can raise awareness. So we thought if we can get my laugh on a ringtone and then kids can download it. And the idea was people would download this ringtone. You can still download it right now. You actually, you actually go on the iTunes store and download it. It's still available. And you put my ringtone uh, on your phone. And then when your phone goes off, literally, if you guys do this, people will look at you and go, what is that noise? And then it gives you an opportunity and empowers you to tell the story. So I'm just going to play uh, the ringtone. And so that's kind of how we came up with it. It was basically use what you got, and that's what I was born with, so we just used it. And that's my kids on the back end of that saying laugh out loud. So that's kind of how we spread the word and spread the awareness. So it still works today. My phone still goes off at places that people go, what is that? And it's like, well, let me tell you what it is. So it's an opportunity to actually pass on the story. So that's kind of how we came up with the name was Let Them Laugh Out Loud. That's fantastic. That's a, that's a great start. So for those who want to... Uh, Assist, participate, learn more, uh, get involved. How can they do that? Well, they can go to our website, letthemlol.com. But then we also felt early on that, you know, this needed to be personal. So Sierra Leone is about 3,000 miles away. So how do we connect this community here um, with a community there? So we actually opened a volunteer center up in Clarence. And people can come in and pack meals that go to the kids in Sierra Leone. We also give those out locally. We've partnered with the food bank and some other organizations working with refugees. So every Thursday from 9 in the morning till 7 at night and Saturdays 9 to 1, people don't have to sign up. They can just drop in, see what's going on there. We do clothing drives. That obviously, the summer clothes go to Sierra Leone. Winter clothes go locally. And it's a great way for families, people. We've had... Um, sorority groups, different kind of groups come in. Businesses will come in as team building to pack meals. We've got videos and pictures and stuff from Sierra Leone in the background. Well, Kate and Joe, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, congratulations on everything that you're doing. I think it's fantastic work. Uh, Dylan, uh, good luck to wrap up your semester, and uh, we'll catch you up down the road, huh? Soon, yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. 
I want to thank Joe and Kate for joining me on the podcast this week, along with Darren Treadway as my co-host. For this episode of Latitude that was presented by the University of Buffalo School of Management Center for Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness. Make sure you check out all of the episodes of Latitude on your favorite podcasting app and head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. For 43 North, I'm Nate Benson, and we'll see you at the next one.